let's dive in here. We've been doing our grand season preview series. We've been doing them for a lot of SEC teams. We will do them for a lot of Big Ten teams a couple of weeks from now. It is LSU night tonight. What we do with these is we give you areas of focus. We give you biggest questions. We give you record projections of all different varieties. And then at the very end, I'm going to give you my official record projection for LSU. This was the period of time last year where we hopped on board. We hurled ourselves, not in front of, like the rest of you did later in the season, but onto the LSU train. And we rode that thing all the way to New Orleans. And I was on the field as that purple and gold confetti rained down all over that LSU team. And so the mood tracker as we start it tonight for LSU, this is a team, this is a fan base that has that kind of house money swagger. It's the kind of swagger, if you've ever watched Wheel of Fortune, if you've had like a historically good round and you've already locked up like 75K and it's in the bank and you go do the final spin thing, if you win, that's great. And Pat Sajak may hand you a new car or something like that. But even if you lose, you're walking away with 75 grand. That is the kind of swagger that only house money can allow you to have. That's what LSU is walking into this season with. If you're watching on YouTube, this is some of the cell phone footage we shot of Ed Orgeron as he was walking off the field in the national title game last year. You can't take that away from LSU. Nobody can take it away from you. You'll have that forever. Even on the darkest of days if they come this season. Just pop in that Clemson replay. Check out on the YouTube link that uh, Georgia replay. It's always going to be there. So... The house money swagger is something that LSU and only LSU walks around with this year. The areas of focus for this team, the perception, this is evolving, to be honest with you, but the perception externally versus the internal perception, because this hasn't always been the case with LSU over the course of the summer. There's a lot of you are familiar with like the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is where, you know, you have that initial period where you think you know everything, and then you have a trough where you realize you know nothing, and then there's sort of what they call the slope of enlightenment. That's once you figure out you know nothing, you start your slow journey towards wisdom. Well, LSU has had this kind of internal version of their own Dunning-Kruger effect going on in the offseason. It's like you have last year, and then you lose everybody, but you're confident. you got a good recruiting class that comes in, and so you're all up here. And then you have opt-out after opt-out after opt-out, and you have negative headlines all over the place, and then you have the low point. But now, whereas the public, I think, still perceives LSU in that trough and the low point there, the internal perception at LSU is, no, we're going to be okay. Like, there is a lot of, I would say, internal optimism down there amongst not only the coaching staff, but people ultra close to the program. This is not going to be a national headline you see. I think nationally, a lot of people think, oh, six and four, seven, three. There's a lot of eight and two, nine and one predictions in LSU circles. And I'm not talking about eternal optimists. I'm talking about people who are realistic and follow the program. So needless to say, there are reasons, and I would call them somewhat newfound reasons, to be optimistic down there. A second thing that I think we all need to focus on is you don't need to overthink the room. This is Miles Brennan's show now. Joe Burrow out the door. The Joe Moore award-winning offensive line of last year, some of them out the door, some of them still there, but this is Miles Brennan's show. And if they go 8-2 and two or better, that means, in all I, I don't even think I need to say that, just that flat out means LSU has gotten very good to elite quarterback play and production from the quarterback position. And by the way, you don't have to have what you had last year. Uh, no one will. I'll make that bold prediction now, LSU or otherwise. No one will have that kind of production this year. And I don't necessarily think you need it. The third thing is the overall team DNA. This is the most intangible of intangibles, but it is one of the very most important storylines for any team. And I would double that for LSU. They go from, just on the surface, ultra talented, and they were ultra experienced, and they were hungry. They had full program buy-in. A bunch of dudes who were going to go on to play Sunday ball in the first round, they were fully bought in. It was none of what can LSU do for me. It was all of what can I do for LSU. They go from that to ultra green in many places, ultra unproven in many places, so therefore question marks in many places, and they got a target on their forehead. Because as much as maybe a fan may say, oh, I don't expect anything more than 7-3 and three from LSU, therefore we don't classify them being hunted like a Clemson or an Ohio State, no one in this conference has lost their receipt from last year. Alabama still very well remembers what happened last year. Auburn remembers how close they came last year. Everybody remembers. So it doesn't matter what you think. <laughs> I say that kindly. Everyone in this conference kept their receipt from last year. So you better believe LSU is the hunted. I don't care what a preseason record prediction has on them. Let's talk about biggest questions with LSU. Where's the pass rush coming from? 
I think a lot of people are blanketly saying, oh, their defensive line's going to struggle. Well, they're, they're two very different worlds here, especially going to the even man front here with Bo Pelini. Defensive tackle, the interior of their defensive line, I actually feel really good about. I think Ed Orgeron, I think that coaching staff feels really good about it. I think they have reason to feel good about it. It's the edge where I have the concern. And I think they may be playing some guys out there that in terms of body type, they'd normally like to be able to kick inside, but they just don't have the elite edge rusher options here. And while I may not be worried about that interior all that much, I don't think you know people are going to be racking up 250, 300 yards rushing on LSU. They are going to be in several one-possession type games in the fourth quarter this year, the kind where you need a stop, the kind where you need to pressure or hurry a quarterback, the kind where you cannot allow a team to do what, for instance, you were able to do against Georgia, and that's just stand there and wait for someone to come open because I don't care which secondary you're going up against, including yours, best one in the country is not throwing a blanket over someone for nine seconds. That doesn't happen. Second best question here, or biggest rather, is what is this offensive line going to allow this defense to do? I remember this time a year ago, we were getting ready for the season. I guess it was a little bit earlier than this time a year ago, and offensive line was a question at LSU, but some people inside the program were saying a lot is being overblown about the questions around our offensive line because the offensive philosophical shift here is going to be such that if there are weaknesses and vulnerabilities here, we can mask them. Well, what happened was LSU went on to win the Joe Moore Award, as I mentioned earlier, best offensive line in the country. So he had the best quarterback in the country with the best offensive line in the country, at least in terms of the award, in front of him. So now a lot of that changes. And you have Miles Brennan, so you come back to earth a little bit, you would figure from a quarterback production standpoint, but you also wonder when, when you know offensive line play and the difference in just the fractions of a second and fractions of an inch. That's the kind of stuff that's worth, in all likelihood, one or two wins. If you're going to play a lot of one-possession tight ball games, which I think they will, those fractions of seconds and inches, that's all the difference in the world. And last year, they were able to come out on the plus side in that equation, and that is a big question mark for me this year. The third one, and I rarely take our biggest questions and focus on one non-quarterback player, much less a true freshman but we're going to do it here. I could not have been any bigger a believer in Eric Gilbert, even during his recruitment. I was very surprised when he committed to LSU, and he has obviously since signed with LSU. He's got really good choice and style there, as you can see in the shorts if you were watching on the video. Eric Gilbert is going to be one of the best players in the SEC this year. He's never played a down, never played a down in college football. I think, if healthy, of course, he will be one of the best players in the SEC this year. What I wonder about him is, they're going to play him, obviously. He's going to be one of the focal points of their offense, and they'd be dumb not to. I wonder what he allows them to do in terms of multiplicity and flexibility. Last year, when you watched LSU, they never had to sub. They just go up and down the field. 12, 13 play drives, if it took them that long to score, you get the idea here. They never had to sub. Tempo, 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 and you couldn't sub, and they could go heavy, and they could go full spread on you and keep the same kind of players on the field. I wonder if Eric Gilbert allows them to do that or if when he's on the field, you understand what's coming. Now, you may still not be able to stop it, but you understand they're throwing the ball here. Or is Eric Gilbert the kind of guy who can inline block for you as a true freshman and be a viable option doing that? Can he get his nose dirty? Is he the kind of guy, even as a true freshman, who is so advanced physically that he can do that? So those are some questions that I have about LSU. As for record projections, as I've told you, and if you haven't watched these before, what we like to do here, instead of doing the predicted win, 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 loss, win, 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 loss, seven and three, eight and two, that's what we think you're going to do. What we try and do is apply something that's a little more data-based and a little more skillful in nature than just guessing who's going to be healthy two months from now. So what we do is we apply a toughness rating to every game that you play. A lot of situational factors are taken into account here. So Colin's got that graphic for us, and we're going to show you LSU's schedule this year, and I'm going to tell you 1 to 10, 10 being the toughest, what I think about these games. And I want you to take notice of something. I'm going to come back to this in a second. LSU does not play a game rated 7 or higher until week 4, but they do play four games eventually rated 8 or higher. They do play them. They're just a little bit later in the season. I got them playing two games rated 10. That's at Florida, and that's against Alabama at home. We got two more games rated 8 or 9. Schedule makers did them a favor now because uh, they only got four of them. Some teams in this conference play five or maybe even six of that nature. They got five games rated six to seven. No reason why they shouldn't be able to win every single one of those games. That's not a prediction. 
My prediction's coming in just a second. And then they got one game rated five or less. So let's talk about what our model spit out. This is what our model spat out for the best, worst, and most likely record projections. Wide variance here because of the talent, but also the inexperience. Best case for LSU is all the way up at nine and one. The worst case was five and five, and our computer model has seven and three as its most likely record projection for LSU this year. I got to be honest with you. I went against our own model projection with LSU by one game, and I actually bumped my official prediction of LSU up to eight and two, and it is heavily influenced by what I've heard out of there in about the past week and a half, and it's because the same People that had the same optimism last year have optimism this year, not to the degree they had last year, but it's the kind of reputation that you start to depend on. It's the kind of people you know you can depend on, and I don't think that they'd necessarily sell me a bill of goods. And the other thing that I want to focus on that led me to lean towards 8-2, and two, which is closer to the best case, I guess, than what our model spat out for the most likely, I look at their schedule that Colin just showed you there, and like I said, they don't start out with Alabama week one, Florida week three. That's not the way their schedule sets up. So if they're vulnerable, they'll be the most vulnerable, it stands to reason, early in the season. But you look at the schedule Colin's showing you, Mississippi State, double-digit favorite, Vanderbilt, double-digit favorite, Missouri, double-digit favorite. They have almost a month to get whatever they need to get in order in order before they play Florida. Now, that Florida game is not a game that I figure them to be favored in. It's a game that's winnable, certainly. And if they were to get through that, or even if they don't get through that, look at how this sets up for them. South Carolina coming in there, you may wonder why that's a seven. Look what it's sandwiched between. Games against Florida and Auburn. On the road, no less. That's why it's a seven, not because South Carolina is going to set the world on fire this year. It is a workable schedule. It is not easy, but it is workable. And after they get through that stretch of Florida and Auburn, and there's a bye week there, and then Alabama, three games in five weeks, I mean, who in the world knows what Texas A&M is going to be? I only know what I know about A&M now. I don't know what a and is going to be at the point they played. I and mean, that's a rivalry game. A&M's got a very good roster. It's been dealt a couple of blows lately. But 8-2, and two, that's what I'm going with for LSU for my most likely record projection this year. And I will take your comments. Where else? In the comment section.